hopefully it will give you some ideas for new things which are open questions and uh, some of you might be interested to work on. So sort of apologies to those of you who know PTMs inside out, there will be quite a few slides of basic introduction, but um, hopefully it'll be a bit of a refresher for those of you who, who know a bit about the area. So as many of you probably know, PTMs are these sort of chemical changes which can happen to proteins, and they really are Im embedded and important in you know, almost all processes of life. Um, you know, I won't go through lots of detail on PTMs, but particularly in cell signaling, how cells make rapid changes to responses is governed largely through PTMs. So if you want to make a new gene expression and produce new proteins, that's relatively slow. If a cell wants to do something quickly, usually you do that with a reversible modification. So you can change on cascades or protein uh, gains a phosphorylation site, for example, that changes its function and you can pass the signal very quickly. Um, and when we think about disease research in sort of biomedical areas, for example, it is often uh, mutations that occur in modification sites which are causative for disease, so particularly in cancer. Uh, and many of the anti-cancer drugs target kinases, which are the enzymes that, that are responsible for adding phosphate to proteins. There's vast amounts of research and lots of great useful databases. Um, there are many hundreds of PTMs known. Uh, one of the most useful databases in the mass spectrometry context is Unimod, which lists uh, all of the known PTMs that can be measured by mass spectrometry, as well as lots of chemical artifacts and other modifications. Um, so when we're thinking about this in the mass spectrometry context, Largely, we tend to think of PTMs in the sense of a mass shift on an amino acid. So phosphorylation causes this mass shift just under 80 Daltons, uh, for example, on serine residues. So in a spectrum, if we're looking for is phosphate present, we're now looking for a spectrum in which instead of the regular mass of serine, we're looking for the mass of serine plus just under 80 Daltons. Now, that is relatively straightforward. Uh, some complexity occurs uh, with a concept called neutral losses. And I'm not going to talk a lot about these, but it is important when we think about what confidence we have. And this, this is a, a sort of an inconvenient problem. So lots of modifications, um, they tend to have fairly weak bonds to the amino acids. And so when you fragment that peptide to gain some sequence information, sometimes part or all of the modification is lost. So it's, serine may no longer have the mass of plus 80. It might have lost the 80 Daltons, or it might have lost the 80 Daltons and an additional water molecule. So instead of being plus 80, you've now got a minus 80. So these make uh, site assignment extra challenging. When we're thinking about PTM analysis, um, largely there's two different kinds of workflows that we're talking about. So in the sort of upper branch of this workflow uh, is where most data on modifications comes from and that's where you start with your sample, you extract your proteins, you do a triptych digest to get it into peptide form, but then you want to do a specific enrichment step for one kind of modification. So these are different experiments that you want to study multiple modification types. So phosphorylation is by far the most uh, studied modification and lots of people use uh, like a metal ion enrichment. So phosphate binds to metal ions which you have in a column and then you can wash them through when you've got a strongly enriched sample for phosphopeptides. Then you do your database search and at that stage you'd search for your peptides to either be unmodified or phosphorylation on the standard known sites, which are serine, threonine, or tyrosine. And then after the database search stage, you may do additional PTM scoring. The reason you need to do that is there's lots of peptides that have more than one serine, threonine, or tyrosine. And so you need to figure out which of those positions was actually modified. The other kind of workflow, which I'm not really gonna talk about, is where you do a global proteome, you don't enrich for any specific modification, and then you, you do a somewhat specialized database search. 
these tend to allow you to discover new kinds of modifications or uh, a small number of modifications without enrichment but many modifications are relatively low abundance because they're usually a lot of them are sort of on off switches and on the proteins quite often they're in the effective off position so you might have low site occupancy so it's quite hard to find modifications through this route and in the database search stage you can't just do a regular search for all the mods in unimod for example the search space gets too big so there are a number of search engines that do multiple passes through the data looking first for what are the unmodified peptides and therefore proteins you can discover and then restricting the database search space to only those proteins and then looking for different modification types but mostly i'll be talking about this upper workflow where we're doing some kind of enrichment and looking for just one kind of modification at a time so i'm not going to talk at all about uh database search engines i'm guessing that most of you in the room are fairly comfortable working with search engines and have some appreciation of how sequence database works so i'm going to jump in at a later step which is where many of you uh, will probably know how to get the data here but may not know what comes next so let's say uh, our search engine says that for a given spectrum i'm pretty confident that i've seen this particular peptide sequence p e p t y d e s e r and i think it's got a and it, for its mass to fit the precursor mass, it must have exactly one phosphorylation. Now, the phosphorylation could be on the threonine, the tyrosine, or the serine, generally speaking. In the second half of the talk, I'm gonna explain why that might not always be the case, but in the vast majority of phosphoproteomic studies, that's the working assumption. So what the search engine has done is match sets of largely B ions and Y ions if we're doing the common HCD fragmentation technique and uh, to the, from the theoretical set of ions to the ions that are in the spectrum. So what I've got in this table is just the theoretical ions you get from the three potential candidates just to work you through, talk sort of walk you through what data we can actually discover. So I hope this is visible to you but in bold are the theoretical ions that actually differ between these candidates. So as you'll see, if we're trying to differentiate, is the phosphocyte on the threonine compared to the tyrosine, only the B4 ion and the Y6 ion are gonna be able to tell us the difference, basically. So we've got very quite low chance of being able to differentiate. All the rest of the ions give us no information. If it could be the serine that's uh, near the C-terminus, then we have more ions that can distinguish. So indeed, um, if you have potential sites that are nearer together, it's already statistically more difficult to differentiate them. Okay, so that's just a, a problem, an inconvenient problem that we have to deal with. So how are we gonna go about differentiating these? So the search engine may have a first pass go at this, but most search engines aren't specifically tailored for differentiating these. So uh, I've sort of uh, simulated or faked some data here that's effectively perfect. So uh, this spectrum matches perfectly this first candidate, and I've visualized it in Protea Wizard. There's a few very low intensity noise peaks here, but I've put in every peak in the experimental spectrum. So this is better data than you almost ever get. But every ion is matched between the experimental spectrum and the theoretical. If we then look at the second candidate where the phospho could be on the tyrosine, what I've done in the simulation is, well, the B4 and the Y6, which are the only ones that can differentiate, are present in the, the uh, first candidate but not in the second. So they only match uh, the phospho being on the threonine, but not on the tyrosine. So there's a range of scoring algorithms, and I'll present some of these to you later, which fit this into a statistical model and say, broadly speaking, what's the probability that the B4 and the Y6 could have been made by chance? 
generally that's quite a low probability, so I'll give a much higher probability weighting that this candidate is the correct one and not the second candidate. So broadly speaking, this case would be well differentiated by one of these PTM scoring algorithms. But generally, it's not that clear cut. So I'm still giving almost perfect spectra. I start with the same sort of top spectrum, but here for the second candidate, where I'm considering there's an error here, this should be the phosphor and the tyrosine, I've actually said, well, actually, there is a really low intensity match here of the B4 and the Y6 that could also support the phospho being on the tyrosine as well as the threonine. So if you're only considering exact iron matches, these would now score equally well and you get no statistical differentiation. And the algorithms for PTM scoring, if they didn't do anything else, would basically say, I cannot tell the difference. It could be on the threonine, it could be on the tyrosine. Okay. So here in this table, um, there's a number of different algorithms which exist, and there probably are more that I've missed here, but these are several that have been written about in reviews, and a few of these uh, I've got experience of. And so a critical step that all of the algorithms do in some way or other is what we might call peak picking, or to look at it another way, is actually to consider the intensity of the ions themselves. And so um, quite a few of these, so A-score and PTMRS, which are uh, some of the older algorithms, but still quite popular, what they do is they only allow a certain number of peaks per 100 Thomson windows. They basically bin up the spectrum, and then they say, okay, I'm only gonna look at the top three peaks in each bin, and I'll score again and again and again with different numbers of peaks per bin, and then see if I can better differentiate the top candidate from the second candidate. And that often then will give you a score differentiation. Other algorithms like uh, Lucifer and PTM Profit actually use the sort of absolute or scaled intensity of the ions intrinsically in their statistical model. So in that case I showed you would give more weighting to the first candidate than the second based on the intensity of the ions. Some of the older algorithms uh, don't appear to use high mass accuracy uh, in their implementation, whereas others do. And over the last sort of five or six years, I guess we've moved to the point where it's more common that uh, labs are generating high-res, high-res data, that means high-res precursor and high-res fragmentation, and that is very useful for PTM site determination. So the algorithms that don't use high-res data for uh, differentiation probably tend to perform worse. Um, in terms of availability, many of these algorithms have sort of been published as standalone tools, um, and that makes it not completely straightforward to use them, um, so, or they've been re-implemented. So A-score, for example, is a, quite an old paper, has been implemented in the commercial tool Peaks. PTM score is built into MaxQuant. Mascot Delta, you can apply yourself as post-processing to Mascot. Um, Protein Perspector has its own algorithm. Lucifer is a standalone tool. PTMRS is part of Proteome Discoverer and PTM Profit is a recent algorithm that's been added to the TPP, and that's one that uh, Eric has worked on. So if you want to know more about PTM Profit, uh, go and talk to Eric, I would suggest. So I think I've talked through this. Um, in general now, the algorithm then fit these matches into a statistical model, essentially saying, what's the chance of getting this many matches? So like in this top case, we'd have maybe uh, 16 matches in the bottom case now with peak picking, only 14 matches. And from that, they turn into some estimation of the probability of the top candidate being correct versus the bottom. And then each of the algorithms give you some score output. Just to, uh, as a brief aside, when I was writing these slides, this is something that I've been aware of for a while and my group had started some software in this area, but we haven't uh, actually got it to publication yet. When people go and publish PTMs in journals, so particularly MCP, 
MCP and other journals ask you for annotated spectrum visualizations. So actually PDFs associated with the manuscript or more commonly the use of a tool into which you can load the data. And I guess this relates to, for example, the universal spectrum identifiers that Eric talked about. But it's a big issue that as far as I can tell, the vast majority of tools that people are using for spectrum visualization are different from the tool that they will have used for uh, scoring their PTMs. And I, I don't think it's well appreciated that the PTM scoring algorithm is doing its own peak picking, um, often in multiple iterations. So that means that many of the spectrum visualizations that have now been uh, used to support publications don't actually represent the data that was used. So this feels like a big problem that many people are probably unaware of and kind of a hole in the market. So for all of these different tools, ideally, I would like to have these integrated into a viewer that could say, you scored with this algorithm and here are the exact peaks we use to differentiate your two different candidates. But that's not the current practice and it, and it really should be. So which is the best of those PTM scoring algorithms to use? I, I haven't seen that many benchmarking papers. Benchmarking is quite hard to do actually, because really you need to use synthetic peptides where the PTM site is known in advance um, to know the true sort of false localization. Um, and these synthetic sets themselves might have problems. So the synthetic peptides might have been incorrectly manufactured, and maybe problems in the fragmentation and so on. But I was associated one such benchmarking study for which all the data is available that was led by Claire Ayres. We benchmarked a couple of different approaches for doing the, the bioinformatics and also lots of different ways of doing the fragmentation and running the instrument. So to cut a very long story short, um, we found that the best way of using uh, your modern sort of Orbitrap based instrument was to do uh, Orbitrap, Orbitrap and using HCD, which gives you a fairly pure set of B and Y ions. Some reports in the literature had suggested that doing a mixture of ETD and HCD, so ETD is a softer ionization, could give you better performance, but we actually found that that didn't work in our hands. And the best performance was just using simple HCD, Orbitrap, Orbitrap, high res high res And we also found that using Mascot with the PTMRS uh, algorithm gave better performance than using Andromeda, which is part of MaxQuant, and their PTM score algorithm. And there's some discussion in the paper as to why we thought that was the case. We're going back over those data sets now, and I'm working with Eric and some others on this to use TPP and the PTM profit and look at peaks and A score on the same data set to see how they perform as well. But one thing that an important kind of message to get across um, is that these algorithms in general give you what looks like a relatively arbitrary score when really what we want is a statistical measure like false localization rate. So false localization rate is a kind of global measure of how many sites have been correct or wrongly assigned. And what we discovered was here, we, these are some sort of calibration curves to look at the different fragmentation modes um, and PTM score versus PTMRS. And what we discovered was these, these scores from the algorithms have some quite big differences in what false localization rate they give you. So particularly it seemed that most people tend to say PTMRS of 0.99 or 99% is what you should go for. But we found in some cases with ETHCD, uh, that could give you a rather high false localization rate. You'd have to set a rather different threshold. So um, what I kind of feel is necessary is an independent measure of false localization rate. And if you think through our sort of hypothetical example, if you do a search and you don't set a good or any peptide spectrum match FDR threshold, your data set would have thousands of wrong peptides in. 
and every peptide that's wrongly identified and only has a single ST or Y in for a phosphorylation experiment automatically gets a PTMRS or PTM score of one, meaning I am certain I've got the site right. So you could have a very high false localization rate depending on how you process and filter your, uh, your first pass search engine results. And this sort of interplay between the filtration of your search engine results and the PTM scoring, which is usually a post-processing step, I don't think is really well understood. Um, so another issue um, is that you know, we need better sort of ways of, of calibrating between false localization and, and the scores that are actually done. If you go and look at the literature, these sort of arbitrary score thresholds are generally used. So it's quite common you see studies just saying, I use PTMRS greater than 0.99. And if you go and look through quite a lot of papers, you actually see I use PTMRS greater than 0.75. And based on results I've looked at, this can give you a very high false localization rate, maybe 20, 30, 40%. Uh, so I think that's really bad practice. But because we don't generally have the equivalent of the kind of uh, decoy database method for validating search engine results, we're in the same position we were with general search engine results around 15 years ago when there's a temptation for labs to boost their numbers by having two weak thresholds. So that's something the computational proteomics community, I think, need to push and try and get a handle on this. So um, for the next sort of 10 minutes or so, I'm gonna move into uh, a study that came out of Claire Eyre's lab uh, about how we search for unusual modifications. I've talked a little bit about phosphorylation on serine, threonine, or tyrosine, very extensively studied. Um, particularly for sort of cell signaling and cancer research. And phosphorylation has been associated with all of these different sort of processes and implicated as the cause or consequence of many diseases. And it's really dominated very much by serine uh, and threonine and to a lesser extent tyrosine. And for those of you that don't know the sort of biochemistry, these are effectively two completely different evolved mechanisms where you have serine threonine kinases and you have tyrosine kinases which are largely only in, in animals so they, they've evolved uh, differently. There's been sort of emerging reports in the literature in the last few years that phosphohistidine also occurs in vertebrates. It's known to occur in plants to a reasonable extent but the extent to which it's actually occurring in vertebrates is much less well known, but various studies have, have sort of emerged showing quite compelling evidence. And there seem to be two different forms of phosphohistidine called form one and form three, relating to slightly different biochemistry. Um, but the re one of the reasons why it's proved so elusive um, is that, as I mentioned, most people are doing phosphopeptide enrichment uh, and when you're doing that with a titanium dioxide, that's done under acidic conditions. And phosphohistidine is known to be unstable at low pH. So almost certainly during lab processing, uh, the, this, these phosphohistidines, the phosphate is just dropping off before it even gets to LCMS. So you just could not observe it. So all standard workflows for phosphoproteomics uh, will miss phosphohistidine, essentially. And so Claire Eyre's lab approached this to think about, well, what can we actually do to identify uh, P-his-containing peptides? So what they did was they uh, looked into reports that strong anion exchange column chromatography can actually enrich for phosphopeptides. And the reason for this is to do with the, the side chain chemistry that phosphopeptides have stronger interactions um, when you, um, as you change the pH in a Sachs column. And they have different kind of interactions from non-phosphorylates. As you change the pH in the column, you get this separation whereby you can get your non-phosphorylated peptides to a loop first, and then your later fractions, you get this enrichment. And because you can stabilize the, the pH under these uh, cases, you can see phosphohistidine. 
and Claire's lab uh, have demonstrated this through a number of studies. And what they began to show was that as well as phosphohistidine, there are quite a number of other what are called non-canonical phosphorylations that start to emerge. Now, um, as I mentioned, canonical is phosphoserine, threonine, and tyrosine. And there have been these kind of sporadic reports uh, of phosphorylation happening on all of these amino acids, but the extent so far that they happen in vertebrates and the actual site confirmation has been almost completely elusive so far. Now, when you start to think of this in it from a computational proteomics kind of point of view, you've now got quite a challenge. And this is one that hasn't really been well addressed, is how you search for such a wide range of possible modifications, particularly when it comes to site confidence. So this slide just summarizes, as soon as you increase the number of possible sites or modifications you're looking for, from the same number of peptide candidates, your database size increases combinatorially. And so I did a kind of a worked example, just thinking through what that combination would be. And so if in a standard set, uh, you had a precursor mass, and let's say this is human uniprot, um, and you have a narrow window of tolerance, in a very happy circumstance, you're searching for no modifications, you might have only 10 candidates in the precursor window. This is a very easy uh, spectrum to differentiate now. If you also think, well, it might have a methionine in, and that could be oxidized or not, uh, you, you double your search space. If you look for phosphorylation on serine, threonine, or tyrosine, it goes up even more. Now, if you look for phosphorylation on all of these possible amino acids, it goes up vastly, so 270 fold by my estimation. It's very approximate. So this matters for a lot of reasons. Um, when you just consider your mascot search results, uh, which a lot of people use, you get this kind of number that's called an iron score, which is an inverse log of the p-value. But what you actually use for ranking your peptides and doing your global uh, FDR on is the e-value which in the mascot case comes from the p-value multiplied by how many candidates you've considered in the precursor mass window. So very basically speaking, this means if you did a search uh, without any modifications and you got an e-value of 0.1, that seems maybe it's kind of okay, that goes up to an e-value of 27 by searching for all of these mods. So you've basically made your statistical power 270 times weaker, which is a very bad thing to do. And you also have a much longer search. So in Claire's non-canonical study, we had quite a bit of work to do to control for uh, this loss of statistical power. So very briefly, we did search for all these modifications, but we did a first pass search where we only looked for phosphopeptides, sort of canonical phosphopeptides, in human uniprot, the 20,000 sequence version. Then we went back and did a second search for all of this combination of modifications, but only on the proteins we had preliminary evidence were in the database. So we cut down from 20,000 proteins to around 7,000 proteins. We then uh, discovered, um, we used mascot followed by PTMRS, and we set different thresholds of PTMRS. And you can see we are now able with uh, the SACS processing to enrich in an unbiased way at different PTMRS thresholds, we got rather a large number of non-canonical modifications. And as you can see, as we got in the later SACS fractions, in generally got a lot more phosphorylation and we also saw a lot more of the non-canonicals. So we got now, this is showing example results of PTMRS 0.9, where we're seeing rather a lot of potential sites uh, at these non-canonical positions. But, you know, so I worked with Claire and her team through multiple iterations of this data, but throughout I was concerned about the false localization rate, because I mentioned before, PTMRS has never been calibrated to search for such a wide range of modifications. And so I was always worried 
even if we set the PTMRS 0.99, it looks like we're getting lots of phosphorylation sites, but can we really estimate the false localization rate? So in a moment, I'll come on and explain how we did that. Um, but one other thing that we did was there was always this worry by doing this search strategy, do, are we in fact just finding lots of false discovery? So we applied exactly the same computational framework using this so-called UPAC separation method, this unbiased separation method versus a titanium dioxide method. And as you can see, at any of the PTMRS thresholds, we do still see this, this strong enrichment for uh, phosphorylation, particularly on aspartate, uh, glutamate, lysine, and arginine. And in the titanium dioxide results, uh, which we predicted we would not find the non-canonicals, we still don't. So that gave me some confidence that this isn't just false discovery by our search strategy, because if it was all the search strategies just giving you lots of false positives, we should also see them in the titanium dioxide enriched set, which we weren't doing. Um, but I also wanted to have uh, a second method which gave us independent verification. So we used this what's called phosphoalanine method, which we'd heard sort of various presentations of at meetings, and we sort of implement our own version. I've later discovered there are some papers that had a similar method many years ago, but for some reason it doesn't appear to have taken off. So I think we thought we'd invented this method, but as I've done more reading, we clearly haven't, and other people have other iterations. But the basic framework is that alanine chemically cannot be phosphorylated. And so what I suggested we did, we do two completely parallel searches, one where we search for all the residues we're interested in, and then a second search where we switch out one of these residues, in that case we switched out cysteine, and we switched in alanine. Now the pipelines then progress completely in parallel. We're never going to use the second set of results for anything other than global correction. We filter both of them at let's say 1% peptide FDR, and you also filter both of whatever you think is the right threshold to use. So in this case, let's say PTMRS 0.99. In pathway two, we get to the end of our pipeline and so alanines have we seen via each step. And that's important because we've treated both sets in the same way. Now, alanine uh, does not have in frequency as all the other amino acids. So what it is modeling, I believe, is randomly assigning a phosphorylation site acid. So you need to consider how many chances the algorithm had to give it to an alanine compared to another amino acid. So we simply estimated the false positive rate, count or the false discovery rate, as the count of phosphoalanines in the final results, then uh, normalized by how frequent alanines are versus, for example, how frequent serines are. So that's the count of false positives. And then the false localization rate, that count of false positives over the count of phosphoserine sites. So you basically normalize by the amino acid counts. And we had to do quite a bit of other uh, processing, which I won't go through the detail, but also how we get from uh, your initial pass where you have uh, effectively redundant results to non-redundant results as you count the number of different sites because they occur differently in the phosphoalanine from how they do in the common amino acids from say the phosphoserine. So there's a bit more detail in our paper. And I'm not convinced the method we've got is absolutely perfect, but it did give us this independent verification. So what we are then able to show is at different PTMRS thresholds, which is shown here, uh, what our false localization estimates are and they are indeed pretty high for some of these amino acids where we know they are quite it's still quite difficult to discover but they're certainly not one so it's not we're not it's not completely false localization but also it's not where we'd want to be of maybe a few percent false localization which it is approaching that kind of value for serine threonine or tyrosine it's much higher 
for the other amino acids. But by then estimating our false positive count, we can also then estimate the true positive count. Um, and again, we estimate that there are large numbers of uh, phosphorylation sites, now particularly on um, glutamate and aspartate, uh, potentially even exceeding tyrosine, which is kind of known to be this canonical uh, phosphorylation site. So while the methods are still evolving, it's still very difficult to discover the true sites. Um, this is, you know, a potentially large finding because uh, sites on this scale have never been before discovered for these non-canonical sites. So it's quite a big splash in the EMBO journal a couple of months ago and, and made the front cover. And so for those of you interested in phosphorylation, I'd encourage you to read that paper and, and get in touch. So I've been talking for quite a long time and I want to leave a bit of time for questions. So just to sort of finish up, um, I mentioned that it was first appeared in the literature many years ago uh, that we kind of need the equivalent of a decoy database search method, method for false localization. And even not considering the non-canonical phosphorylation, it's not generally done for canonical phosphorylation on serine, threonine or tyrosine. And I've been trying to work on, you know, should we roll out, try and roll out to the community more widely, the phosphoalanine approach and, and get it implemented very regularly in pipelines? And should we be doing on every search, phosphoserine, threonine and tyrosine, and an independent search, let's say, of serine, alanine and tyrosine, based on the, the idea that, well, alanine's frequency is quite similar to threonine. Um, but I still think there are flaws in this method. So I kind of throw it out to you to have a think about how we might do it better. So one particular flaw, um, if the true site of phosphorylation is let's say on a threonine, and we've done this method that switches out threonine and searches for alanine, you just wouldn't at all in the phosphoalanine search. And you probably wouldn't get other peptides being confidently discovered. So I think, you would probably underestimate false localization rate in the PSAY search compared to the PSTY search. And how we correct for that, I'm still not sure. Other kind of problems, it is, it is absolutely certain that there are mixed spectra out there where you have a peptide where the phosphorylation position flips from sometimes it's a serine, sometimes it's a threonine, and there's a single phosphor site. Now that means you'd have mixed spectra because they, they would elute off the column at exactly the same position. And my guess is that all the PTM scoring algorithms are gonna fail in that case. They just say, I'm not confident. Whereas what they should be saying is, I'm very confident you've got this form and you've got the iron supporting that form. So to go back to my example much earlier on, where we did have iron supporting both cases, if those ions were quite intense, you should be saying, I'm confident you've got this and you've got this, whereas all algorithms at the moment say, I've no idea, it's either that or that, and they'd be filtered out. So I think that's a problem. Lastly, there is a bit of a gotcha. I'm aware that some search engines, I think Peaks was doing this, they may have changed that behavior, that they have an inbuilt common modification setting where their, their score is boosted. So PSTY would be boosted in its score over phosphoalanine, which would also cause a problem for this method. And lastly, I mentioned this right at the outset, but then didn't touch on it again. Um, some of the algorithms for PTM scoring look for these so-called neutral losses, um, but it changes the search space if you're then gonna search for these kind of fake localizations, let's say on alanine, and I don't know how you should best handle that. So I'm, I'm gonna finish up just by sort of saying, um, PTM localization is uh, hugely important for biology. You might think, well, maybe it's enough to know it's a phosphor protein, um, but is the site that important? Well, it, it is because, for example, um, completely different biological pathways are involved in serine threonine versus tyrosine phosphorylation. So you do need to know which of those it is uh, to know how to study the biology. And for the non-canonical phosphorylation, the kinases are largely completely unknown. So we do need to know 
have we really got those sites? As I mentioned, mutations in particular PTM sites can be disease causing, so you really wanna know what they are. And I'm now doing quite a lot of work on crops and loss or gain of PTM sites are very frequently associated with useful traits. So there's kind of a growing area of science that's associating single nucleotide polymorphisms with PTM sites. So again, for that case, you do need to know the exact site of localization. So I'll kind of finish with this challenge. I think in general, PTM localization is still stuck somewhere in the past. There are loads of algorithms, but not enough benchmarking and not enough independent testing done by each lab as they do their search. And I think that's the big challenge that we as a community should be addressing and, and is still not done yet well enough. Um, so a, sort of a big thank you to, for a lot of the results come from Claire Eyre's lab. The lab's doing some great things. Uh, and we've had lots of funding for this work from the UK Funding Council, BBSRC, and we have this new grant starting, funded by BBSRC and NSF, which is joint between my team, Juan Antonio's team, and Yasset, who I think is there, uh, and Eric's team uh, over in the States. Uh, and I'll finish there, and I'll happily take some questions.